Hi, this is the Critical Design Review kickoff presentation for MIG to Order, and we will have your slides available to you in your National Registry and also a link or links to the breakout session uh, playlist on our YouTube channel. Welcome to the 2022 Denver Best Kickoff Critical Design Review Presentation. I'm Carolyn Bauer, the Hub Director for the Rocky Mountain Best Hub. Let me introduce the concepts of the Critical Design Review so that you are prepared for your team presentation, which happens at approximately week five to a group of best judges. Let's use this fun graphic as an example of what a good design may or may not be and how to communicate it. You'll see the first five examples of a tree swing designed by various people, the project sponsor, what was described in the request of the project, how it was designed by an analyst, a bunch of programmers, and how it was installed at the user's site, which is really a funny one. But the sixth one on the lower right is what the user actually wanted. The goal of a critical design review is to design a product that's what the user want or wants or needs. This overview shows the five main topics I'll try to discuss during this presentation. We'll start with the basics. What's a design? What's the engineering design process? And then where does the CDR fit in? What is a CDR? And what are the expectations for a best CDR? Then a description of CDR terms and example concepts will help you maneuver through the production of your CDR. And then your best CDR presentation expectations and evaluation and how you can make a great best CDR presentation. Let's start with some important foundational concepts. What is a design? And in this CDR for your best uh, project this year, it's about what's the design of your robot. And the design is about creating your robot, the form and the function. The form is what does it look like and how is it made? And the function is, what does it do? And of course, it's about achieving the objectives, which are the tasks you need your robot to do, given the constraints, like, well, I don't know, the, the weight and the size. The engineering design process is the fundamental process used to design any product. In our example, it's your robot. You start with understanding the problem. Well, how do you do that for best? You read the rules, you think about them, you look at the drawings of the game field, and you determine what the requirements are for your robot. You research similar designs of other perhaps real world examples of something similar. And you inventory the resources available. Of course, for you, it's the items in your kit, the software you have that's available, and uh, your access to uh, creating your version of a mini game field for you to practice on. Then you move to the next step. The exploration of the concepts of what the robot perhaps should be able to do, the one you want to design, and the choice of what design you'd like to pursue. Well, during this step, uh, you do a lot of brainstorming with your team. 
you discuss the strategy, how do we want to score, if we want to score those points, what does our robot design look like, if we want to score some other points, what would that robot design potentially look like, if we wanted to do both, what would that robot potentially look like? And then you narrow down what looks like a good approach for you to pursue in your robot design. Then you move to the next step, analyze and prototype. And in this step, you create some simple models or prototypes, maybe on a cardboard, um, may, uh, from any product you can come up with. And the point of that is to see what may or may not work. And the fail early, fail often is very much the truth. You, you just don't know if something's going to work until you try it and try it and try something different. Talk about why it failed. Can you modify it? that design a little bit, morph it, and move on. At this point, when you think you've got a robot design you'd like to pursue and actually manufacture, come down with the detailed design and manufacture it, that's where the CDR occurs. So what's the purpose of a CDR? Well, it's to turn your concepts and your preliminary design ideas into something more concrete. We know what we'd like to do and we need to pursue how we're gonna do it. You present the overall design, how it meets the requirements, how you plan to manufacture it, how you plan to integrate it and test it, and make it do what you want it to do. And of course, the reason why you do it at this point in the design process is that it's the perfect dividing line between the design phases and the build phases. Gives you an opportunity before you start spending time building something that you discover won't work, an opportunity to evaluate and move forward. In a real company, it's where you bring in customers and managers, and there's a very big decision point about does your project move forward or not. And we mean for this to work in the same basic way for you. A very good time to confirm if your design is good. CDRs are very common for engineers, and most of us retired engineers or existing engineers from Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon have been doing CDRs for many years. For you, it's a perfect time to learn now to not be surprised about it during what may be your future career in engineering. We've got links below to a few examples of some CU senior project teams and their CDRs. When you're in industry, you'll present your CDR to customers and senior management. And as a university project, you present your CDR to professor. Okay, let's move on to the best CDR presentation. This is required by every competing best team at approximately week five of the eight week season. Requirements, research, and functionality are three of the main topics. We'll discuss each. In the requirements, you need to present your requirements and your strategies that influenced your design and how those requirements influenced your design. You need to present both the stated, the ones in the rules, for example, and the derived requirements, the ones that as you evaluate what you're trying to accomplish and what you have, some requirements of your own. 
Typically, teams will research real world examples of maybe a drive mechanism or a lift mechanism, and that helps a team decide what their robot design should be. In your best CDR, you need to do the same. Now, regarding functionality, this is very important. You need to Describe your robot in detail and how each task is performed. And typically, the most perfect way to do that is using block diagrams of the major robot components and describe which components accomplish which tasks. Assuming you've done prototyping or modeling of any time, type, you describe that in this functionality section. Your best CDR has five more important sections to discuss during your presentation. The design specifications, components, and system level specifications are a um, more defined detail of what your components and systems are. How much do you expect it to weigh? How big will it be? Some things about power processing did you use in this and we hope the answer is yes some diagrams tables graphs equations calculations something to explain how you arrived at these specifications rather than frankly pulling them out of thin air you'll need to review all of the disciplines used on your robot. It's not just mechanical. It's got software. There's humans that drive the robot, the systems, the electrical behavior. Are you using the sensor or not? Those multidiscipline component, this review are very important. It's also really helpful if you think about the risks of what might go wrong. If you're trying to accomplish a particular task and something goes wrong, do you have a backup plan? And if so, what is it? An example of that is maybe you are trying to score some points that are harder to achieve than some others. And if you spend a certain period of time and can't do it, What's your backup plan for moving on to score some point? And of course, one of the really interesting parts for us is, did you have some really innovating, innovative design elements or processes you used um, in your robot? And lessons learned. Some of these will be lessons specific to what you've learned about creating a robot, and uh, others will be perhaps lessons you've learned about working as a team to create a robot. In the next few slides, I'll take a deeper dive into what we mean by the terms systems and components. I'll discuss the requirements and examples of requirements. Also, then we'll move on to allocating requirements to components and then risk assessment. Okay, let's talk about the terms system and component related to a robot. In this example, we've got four top level components and some possible functions those components might perform. So, the first, a drive platform component. Normally, that's the what you would consider the base or the platform of your robot, plus the wheels and the motors that move the wheels. Some functions of that um, as you design it is um, how maneuverable is it as it moves around the game field? Is it too big to fit through some tight spaces? Do, do you have trouble controlling the speed and the location of it? Is it 
moving way too fast or way too slow? And is there a way to um, change the speed depending on where you are? Another system, top level component, I mean, is an articulated arm, an end effector or gripper component. Um, does your arm and rotate as you need it to, left and right? Does it go up and down as you like? Does it go in and out as you like? Does it grip efficiently? Those are the important functions of an arm. And depending on the game, different functions really matter the most. Now, another top-level component is your software. How is your software used to control your robot? And how is your joystick programmed for the drivers to control the motors, the servos, the sensors? And are they working in a way that's going to help you be successful with your robot? And the human interface, what are the roles? Do you understand the roles of the driver and the spotter? And do they change a little in this particular game, depending on the viewability of the game field and where the robot might be on the game field and the tasks that robot's supposed to accomplish? And can does the driver like the way the joystick is used? during training and practice. Okay, the next group of terms we'll discuss and explore are requirements and examples. What is a requirement? Well, it's a statement of something the, that the system must do to be acceptable to the customer. And what does it specify? What does a requirement specify? Well, specific features or capabilities, as well as some constraints under which the system operates. Now, an example of your best robot right out of the rules is that the robot can be no larger than two feet by two feet by two feet. And a constraint related to that robot is that the robot must fit in the robot start box at the beginning of a match and the driver using the joystick can move the robot out of the start box and begin to accomplish the tasks it's trying to accomplish. Okay, so now let's make sure we understand the kinds of requirements we are now that we have at least one requirement in our minds. So the stated requirements and, and basically for best that comes right out of the rules document and there are both functional and non-functional requirements. So functional requirements are what am I trying to to do? Am I trying to pick something up? Am I trying to Scoot something from one its start location to its ending location where it stores scores points, and of course obvious things like it needs to be able to to drive in the direction you want. Maybe it's forward, maybe it's backwards, uh, maybe it's rotate. You never know, depending on the rules of that year's game. And we've already talked about a non-functional requirement about the size of it and then the functionality of it being able to drive out of the start box. There are a variety of other non-functional requirements you may be able to pull out of the rules document as well. Now a derived requirement is a requirement that you as a developer conclude are very important for your robot in this particular season. Maybe you want your robot, your strategy, as you begin to develop your strategy, 
you realize you want your robot to do certain things to go through a smaller space. So you begin to conclude that a requirement, a derived requirement of your robot is that it be small enough to go through this smaller space. And as you go through the design process, you both verify and validate your requirements, which basically the, the statement at the bottom, are we building the right things? That is verifying the requirement. And then validate it, are we building it correctly? Now it's interesting when you move to the decisions of allocating requirements to your various components. In this slide, we've got discussions about the software on the robot, the robot's hardware, and the humans, the driver and spotters, in the, the use of the robot. As you have an, a requirement, you need to determine where you will satisfy that requirement. Is it the people who need to satisfy that requirement or the software or the hardware? And we've got an example here of allocating requirements. So the possible requirement is needing to maneuver the robot in a tight space. So if you allocate it to the humans, then you, you say, okay, the requirement for the driver is that the driver is trained to accurately control that robot to score all the expected points in three minutes. And that gets a little more complicated because you have multiple drivers. But okay, if you pick the human, that's, the, that's how you allocate the requirement. Okay, maybe you say, no, nope, we'll do that in software. And so a way to do that in the software is to program the joystick so that the driver has some option to make on the joystick where he can change this, he or she can change the speed of the robot, move faster in some situations, slower in others. Ah, that could make maneuvering easier. Okay. And another is the drive platform. You could add sensors to the robot, so before it crashes into something, it would stop. Or maybe you would say the drive platform needs to be smaller. Or maybe you could do multiple allocations. Now at this point, you've done a lot of really hard work evaluating your requirements, well, first creating and then evaluating your requirements, coming up with possible robot designs to achieve your requirements, and evaluated them using some tool like the weighted decision matrix. Now it's a great time to stand back and evaluate your risks. So at this point, you want to. identify some possible risks. It's a very different kind of brainstorming at this point. What can go wrong with the hardware, the software, some of your deliverables, whatever you're, you're evaluating related to your team's efforts? And what can keep your project from performing ideally? So once you've uh, I've identified risks, then you can evaluate where they come from. How likely are they to occur? And, and what do you do um, to try to make it less likely they do occur? And what do you do to make the risk less impas impactful if it happens? And then you'll need to evaluate those periodically and figure out if there are things your team can do differently, can do better 
to help minimize your risks. So let's go through this risk assessment using an example risk. And the risk we've identified is that the CDR presentation isn't ready to give on the due date. Okay. Now let's evaluate that. So let's say the presentation isn't started as of two weeks after kickoff and no one is assigned to create the presentation. Now the likelihood of that is a very high risk. If you haven't started early and nobody's assigned, it is very, very likely you're not going to be ready on week five. You've only got three more weeks. So how do you treat that? How do you how do you try to resolve that risk? Minimize that risk? Well, a really good way to do that would be to establish a CDR plan and and a schedule and assign someone or someones to work on it, to give them a schedule, for example, of when the draft presentation is ready, have them present it, and, and um, have it ready a week before due date so that you can make that presentation even better. Now that should very much mitigate your risk if everybody else is involved as they need to be because of course the person presenting that CDR presentation needs a lot of input from the whole team. And then how do you monitor and review whether you are minimizing the this risk that you've identified? Well, you could create a team risk list review as part of your weekly or bi-weekly team meeting to make sure the draft is ready on time and the people working on it are comfortable with what they're doing, that the rest of the team is communicating all the important information to them and do practice sessions and important tasks like that. Now let's move on for the next few slides to discuss the presentation expectations and the evaluation. What do you expect is going to happen during the presentation? What are the score sheets look like? Ways to help you score high? And then some details about the score sheet itself. Okay, let's discuss the presentation expectations. Your team needs to Select a time to present your CDR that's on your team workflow. And you'll notice that every time slot that your that is available is a 30 minute time slot. Each team is allotted 25 minutes. And then there's a few minutes for the judges to work on their score sheets before they move to the next CDR. You have 20 minutes of presentation time max and then five minutes of Q&A from the judges. The time limits are very strictly enforced. The next topic is that you need to plan your slides accordingly. And that means you don't want so many slides that you're hurrying through and don't have a chance to explain the content well but don't have so few that you don't include all the important items on the score sheet. You need to make sure you have plenty of information to explain to the judges. And you'll probably want to practice this a few times to help you feel more comfortable and to cover all the important slides in time. The next expectation is that the judges will often wait till the last Q&A section, but maybe you shouldn't be surprised if the judges ask questions 
at times where you're perhaps struggling to help you get back on track and to help you understand the important topics of the CDR and come out with the important part, which is to make sure you understand your robot design and if it's a good design to accomplish um, your ability for your team to score points. And then of course you wanna make sure your slides are, are readable, well-organized, and you will find that the rules document gives you some guidelines. And of course the score sheets are very helpful in helping you do this. The score sheets are divided into four sections. The requirements are worth 20 points. The functionality is worth 30. Your design specifications are worth 30. And then your discussion of the innovation risk and lessons learned are worth 20, that total to 100 points. Now we have tips. Make it easy for the judges to find evidence to give you a good score. Give examples. Follow the structure of the score sheet. And the score sheet uh, will also have comments from the judges that will be delivered to you in the registry. And those comments are to be taken very seriously. They will often really help you understand your uh, CDR and your CDR presentations. Now, from our perspective of judging is that the points are earned, not detracted, but we can't give you points for something you haven't shown us. So it's your job to show us the requirements, the functionality, the design spec, and the innovation risk and lesson learned of your robot design and your, your team. And the award be, comes from the judging of the CDR presentation, and this does in no way have any impact on the best award. This is the first of two pages of our discussion of the CDR score sheet. The first category, requirements worth 20 points, divided into three specific topics and the points they're worth. The second category is functionality with four categories. This is the second page of the CDR score sheet with the third category design specification, 30 points, another one of the large point categories with three topics worth 10 points a piece and then the innovation risk and lessons learned with three topic e topics each and the points assigned to them as you put your presentation together if, as much as you can do it in this order with this clarity answering each of the questions the higher you'll score. And the last section of this presentation is how to make a great CDR. And as you see, it's divided into three topics, how to keep up, some advice about practice, and some reference documents. One of the most important things of how, pieces of advice we can give to you about how to have a good CDR is how to keep up. And just like your work with your engineering notebook, at least that's what we hope, you break up the work. You don't procrastinate. At least don't procrastinate everything because you'll never get done if you do. And as we hope you're doing with the engineering notebook, 
Once you've made a bit of an outline, which probably follows the score sheet very closely, you'll fill in what you can as your team makes progress. And of course, at, you'll be coordinating with your team to do that. So as you move through the first few weeks, the information in your CDR presentation will begin to include more and more details. And it's probably up to you as a CDR responsible person to start accumulating that information from your team into a good way to present it. And then make a plan. Um, have a few people working on it. And, and of course, as you get closer to the deadline, there'll be more people working on it than there were earlier. And a piece, I suppose, of the how to keep up is two pieces of important advice about selecting presenters and then practice. So early on, you need to understand you have multiple presenters and you'll probably want to decide which presenter is going to do which section. And of course, then the team and that those presenters will communicate with each other a lot. And as we said, if you're feeling frisky, make a Gantt chart. It's a fun tool to learn how to use and you can give yourself some deadline and goals and that'll help you stay on track and know if you're falling behind, you need to add a few more people and a little more time working on this. And if you're ahead of the game, you can pat yourself on the back. Then when you're getting pretty close, maybe the week before, you practice. And each of the presenters will work together to, to decide how to sort of hand the baton to the next presenter. You'll decide how many minutes each section takes because you've only got a certain period of time and you can't go over and you can't leave the last person with not enough time to do their part of the presentation. And if you can practice in front of adults who are using the score sheet and being really honest, they'll help you improve your presentation. And these two documents are really helpful as references for the design process. There's a engineer, um, engineering design process done by BEST called Understanding and Applying the Engineering Design pro Process. And these two bullets show you the most useful sections for doing your CDR. And then another really helpful document, Robotic Design and Method That Works, is a, a five page summary of the steps to design a best robot. And this is kind of a nice little framework something like a CDR framework. Well, I hope this has been helpful and best of luck and see you soon. Thanks for attending this presentation and a reminder that you can find both the slides and a video of this presentation um, from your national registry.